Hola, flamingos. This is Andrew Mark Rowe, and you are currently breathing in holy flamingo poop. Today on the show, we have Peter Foote, fellow Atlantic Canadian author of speculative fiction. Thanks for coming on, Peter. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's gr- glad to finally meet you. And we've been communicating through texting and Facebook and all that stuff for a few years now. So it's nice to actually have a chat and hear your voice. Same. <laughs> Um, so I want to kind of, before we get into any of the, um, any depth of uh, your work or anything, kind of want to get a bit of background about you. So you're, you, where, whereabouts are you from? I'm born and raised in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. So, um, we're the land of vineyards, vineyards, orchards, and tides. So I, I grew up in an agricultural area in the middle of Nova Scotia. And I currently live about 12 miles away, so I didn't actually fall very far. So, oh, yeah, fair enough. When you find a beautiful spot, you kind of stick close. Yeah, I'm about 10 kilometers from my parents' house where I grew yeah. up. I, I understand. Yeah. And, um, and your your folks have an orchard, is that right? Or yeah. I think they said, yeah. Yeah, no, I grew up on an apple orchard. And since um, I like to eat and not do manual labor, I decided not to take over the family farm. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, as the oldest son, it was kind of expected. And I made my uh, wishes known quite early in life and never looked back. So um, in my infinite wisdom, I was convinced I wanted to be an archaeologist. So I went and uh, studied anthropology in university, which okay. I loved. I loved it, except the fact that I wasn't nearly as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved the field work, the paper writing, not so much. Yeah, fair so, enough. Yeah, fair enough. I was never one for massive. I'd always take the uh, test courses over the paper courses whenever I could no. do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't imagine there was, uh, I, I did a German degree and at, uh, before I, I went to law school, I think it was, I had a two year break or thereabouts after I did my degree and learned pretty soon at thereafter that there wasn't really much I could do with a German degree in, uh, Newfoundland <laughs> aside from figure something else out. Yeah, no, I was similar, uh. I had my BA, but I wasn't quite smart enough for my master's, and I couldn't even get a, a job at the conservators without a master's. So then it was student loan people came a knocking, and I needed to find something fairly fast. So I ended up in the trades, and I've been doing that for since '97 and mm. counting down the days to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And wh- where is it your, where is it work now? I think you told me. I work day. for Agricultural Canada. So oh, okay. um, I'm what's the fancy name is called a power engineer, but it's a fancy name for a boiler and refrigeration technician. So oh, okay. I make the steam for the greenhouses and ices and ice for the coolers and the artificial environments for the, that the scientists use to stress plants or grow monster bugs or whatever so okay okay it's and a lot know- of gauge watching so it gives me an opportunity to be a little creative yeah so i was gonna i was gonna sig into that because um <clears throat> you've been at this for a while now and you've got it's not just writing you also have a i think it's fiction first used bookstore you got to be used bookstore yeah well. no i i work shift work so that means i usually have some time off in the middle of the week and before I was married, I seemed to have a lot of free time. I, somehow it's changed since then, but that's, I'm sure that those two aren't connected in the slightest. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> so, um, but no, I, um, I used to dabble with the odd short story when I was a teenager, like anybody else did. Um, most of my stories were a reflection of um, Dungeons and Dragons campaigns that never actually got played. I loved creating them and drawing intricate maps. Then I realized I had no friends to actually play them. <laughs> so uh, there's even a binder floating around someplace, either here at my folks' place with oh, early 90s stories or adventures that Peter wrote that I'm sure are absolutely dreadful. But um, uh-huh. so, but uh, I first seriously picked up my pen, I guess it would have been in uh, 2015. Okay. And um, that was 
after um, meeting a couple of representatives from engine books in, of Newfoundland. And um, cause I'm a huge reader. So I always make sure when I'm at a con to stop by the publishers to see what's out there. And mm. somehow I started babbling and they convinced me that I should submit to one of their anthologies and kind of the rest is history, but yeah. And you've been, you've been featured in most of engines anthologies, haven't you? I, I, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I, I think I'm one of two or three people who has been published in all of them, all their from the rock series. And I, yeah. I don't know how many they're up to now, seven or eight or something like that. So, um, that's pretty now awesome. There's a, yeah, it is. But it also means you got to pull out your A game every time you submit to them. So uh, <laughs> you get the very it's set, getting a, yeah, it's getting a little bit. Uh, you get a standard you got to live up to now, and like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And now you're you're moving into um, self publishing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've already yeah. self published Molting of a Queen, which I read, and it's, it's fantastic. I highly recommend to anyone listening. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I mostly write short stories or I did because of just time constraints and, and I love short fiction. Don't get me wrong. And I'll probably still always dabble in that, but in honestly, there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, you're not in this for the money all the time, but it is a consideration. So I decided then to explore longer forms and, um, I'm currently working on a passion project, but before I invested a huge amount of time and energy into that, I wanted to see how easy it was to self-publish. And so then that's why Molting of a Queen um, came out. It was my attempt to create something. It's only a 30,000 word novella. Um, I just wanted to see how the process worked, if I could do it, was it um, even the logistics of setting up for bank accounts and an editor and uh, um, uh, formatting and covers and all those little things that are outside of actually putting your pen to paper, see if I was able to do that. And uh, thus far, it's worked out. So um, I kind of quite enjoyed the process. So now I'm I'm going to continue on with that, I believe. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've seen, I think at least one of your covers from the new series that you're you're, you're releasing them in like a, a quick release. Or, or yeah, that's plan. the plan. I haven't actually put up a pre-order link yet. Um, it's I'm calling it my consensus series. So the consensus is for using popular culture. It's a bit like the Federation in Star Trek, but it's nowhere near as regimented. It's Different, ser- uh, different species with some like-minded morals and ethics who agree most of the time to get along. So it's a little bit like uh, the UN and it's yeah. almost as functional as the UN. So uh, that always gives you uh, an opportunity. <laughs> Plenty of <laughs> <laughs> stuff you- to write about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I commissioned um, three covers so that way I um, was able to uh, nab the same artist each time to keep in line with the style. And the third cover, everybody really enjoyed. And um, the, the the design team actually posted it online. So the cover's out there and the book's not done yet. So uh, now I got to live up to that as well. But uh... <laughs> yeah, I did that. Uh, well, it was, it was the first draft was done. So I suppose that wasn't, that was, it wasn't quite the same, but I did that when they had a, it was middle art who did yeah, it. They had a uh, black Friday sale back in November. And I was like, Oh, I might as well get this one done as well. Yeah, no, I used the same. And I think I, I used them based off your recommendation and all actuality. So, um, I've had nothing, um, but good things to say about them and, um, recommend them highly. So yeah, yeah no, the, the plan for the consensus is a rapid release, whether it's either 30 or 60 days, I haven't narrowed it down yet. Um, probably this fall, the first book is done and with the publisher, uh, not the publisher, excuse me, my editor, and that should be back on the 28th. I think that's next week or it could be this week. I don't know. I think it's still March, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's still March. Still the March. Yeah. The computer it, still is the 23rd. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's, it gets a little tricky every once in a while. So, uh, yeah. the first book is with my uh, editor. 
and um, based on their feedback, we'll see how much rewrites are needed. And uh, book two, I'm about two thirds done my second draft of that. And book three, the one that the cover is out in the wild, I have a four or five page draft. I know exactly what's going to happen, but I haven't actually expanded upon anything yet. Okay, so that means, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it uh, sounds to me that you're a bit bit more of the plotter than a pantser, is that? Oh, that... very much so. The only way I can actually get anything done is to plot anything out. Um, when it comes to some short fiction, flash fiction, I am I can pants it, and it's actually a nice little exercise for getting away, away from plotting things. But for anything more than 5,000 words, no, I got to have some kind of a plot. Otherwise, the wheels spin and the tires spin and we don't go anywhere. So. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's, a, it's, yeah. An, interesting, it's an interesting thing just because I know people who do it both ways. Like, you know, personally, I do the most plotting that I do these days is essentially I'll write out all the names of the chapters that'll kind of give me a vague, vague idea. And I have a, I always have a vague idea where things are going. Um, but then it's just kind of go and let it go. But then, but so many people do the plotting method or like, you know, there's a bunch of different styles or ways of doing it. Um, did you like, how did you fall into that? Was that something that you kind of like did a course or some books or um, I started out with the three act version and that was fairly loose. Um, and when I was doing short stories or something in the eight or 9,000 word range that worked quite well. But when I decided that I needed to do something longer form, even just a novella, I needed, I needed more skills. So I actually took uh, Matthew LeDrew's writing course. Mm -hmm. I've heard nothing but good things about that. Yeah, I want to say three years ago. I don't know. Time's awful hard to. COVID time is yeah. tricky. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. It might have been nineteen. I took it twenty nineteen. Okay. Anyways, and um, he uses one of his biggest tools. Anyways, is the Herman Circle, which is okay. a, a, um, and that that really clicked with me and I even have it framed and hanging on my wall down here in my writing nook. And okay. uh, it, otherwise I'd take it off the wall to show you, but it's hang. <laughs> but, yeah, um, no, no, yeah, no. yeah. But um, that really clicked with me. So um, there's been other tools I picked up, but having this happens and it is form, it is quite formulaic, kind of like a uh, police procedural, but um not everybody enjoys that, but it works for me. And I'm sure as my career goes, it may not be quite as rigid as it currently is, but um, I enjoy it. And I kind of know what beats I'm hitting and what ones I'm not. And because mm -hmm. I'm sure you know as well as I do, when you write something, you can look at it and you, and you know you're missing something, but you may be too close to the project to know what it is you're missing. And this mm -hmm. is a pretty good tool for stepping back and looking at it with a bit of a dispassionate eye yeah and then yeah. you can okay yeah now i i can see what the problem is so how am i going to fix it so yeah yeah fair enough yeah. and i mean that's kind of a um it's an interesting quirk i'd say of like genre fiction in particular is that there is it's kind of you know that it, it stuff gets separated out into those acts even if it's not like or like or everyone but like the story beats the different you know the the you know it's almost like there's like an outline or like a underlying structure to a lot of these things and that's actually how i learned it in like a really roundabout uh, way was um joseph campbell's hero with a thousand faces which was basically a deconstruction of myth and how these things kind of fit together um but you know it's uh i i, I find it's, it's you know that's one of the things about genre fiction, I think, in general, like, you know, like if you took a look at like these stories in general, they all kind of find follow a similar sort of to some degree, like, you know, even though like it could be rather than fighting aliens, it could be the zombie horde or, or whatever, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think the difference is between like, say, like, what do you think? Like, because you write a lot of sci-fi. I know you've, you've written some fantasy and horror as well. And, yeah. you know sci-fi i think uh, ursula k 
Kay Leguin, Leguin said, I honestly don't know how, that, how she prefers to have that pronounced. But... Uh, and I never say it tw- the same way twice, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just nod and agree. But <laughs> yeah, um, she said it was kind of like, you know, it's about the, uh, it's like, there's nothing like about the imagination, like science fiction is in compared, like, which I, you know, I, I have, I, to some extent, I agree, but, you know, and I, another, you know, I, I, I just come curious about what you think because you're, you're a huge sci-fi fan from my understanding. Oh yes. And that's kind of how my bookstore, I have a, as you mentioned before, I run a used bookstore of a spare bedroom here in the house that specializes in sci-fi and fantasy. And it only grew because, oh geez, I got this book and I may read it again and I may not. So what do I do with it and put it in a box? And then after 10 years of putting the books in the box, you realize you've just taken up a room. So I have quite an extensive collection both personally and within the store. So I, uh, I uh, certainly know what you mean. Um, mm. And I, and I, and I kind of get what you're saying. Um, sci-fi fantasy, and even to a degree horror gives us an opportunity to really look at ourselves in a way that the setting gives us the opportunity that we don't feel guilty about it because <laughs> there's no real people involved. <laughs> well, kind of you, you get some contemporary or um, um, lit fiction that it seems, um, and I, I'm, I'm not bashing on lit, but um, it seems to take itself maybe a bit more seriously than I want as a reader mm-hmm. where with genre fiction, especially sci-fi and fantasy, you are allowed to not believe and still enjoy. And when you don't have to believe that everything is really true, you can really dig deep and admit some things to yourself as the reader that the author is trying to convey to you. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's interesting that another thing that she said, uh, Ursula, and this was in the preface to, um, um, b- 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 what's that called? Uh, left-handed darkness. The, dark, which, the left-handed darkness. Which was one of the most like I was reading, like li- I was listening to it as an audiobook version. But that breakdown of what the what we do as writers was one of the most astute things I've ever heard about it. To be honest with you, um, and uh, you know, she said that it's kind of like you know, it's, it's pretty trite. Like it's the lies that we tell to tell ourselves the truth, or that that kind of thing, right? Um, but uh you know the one of the things i noticed about your molting of the queen like that was you know ostensibly about going up to an alien planet you know and and uh, this is uh mild spoilers I, i'm just gonna say it here so mm-hmm. if anyone wants to skip past the next couple a couple of seconds um but i mean it was really about the protagonist's relationship with her past and you know the very much so you know and that was i thought that was really well done um I, I was really, yeah, really impressed with it. And I thought it was, it was, it was, you know, it was 30,000 words. So you, you kind of, you got to be focused on, you know, pretty narrow thing to kind of like get, you know, to do that effectively. I thought you did a bang up job of it, man. Thank you. And I appreciate that. And I think some of that might be a reflection that I've spent so many years doing short stories that you have to focus on using the minimum amount of words to tell your story. So mm-hmm naturally i'm an underwriter so then i have to go back and okay just because i i've told the story but i really maybe not have done it in the best way so but no i i think nina is the protagonist in molting of the queen and um she like most of us have our own demons that plague us that nobody else but ourselves knows about and it was yeah it was it was mostly her story and coming to grips with those um hopefully overcoming them and being honest with herself and i think that's one of the nice things about drawing a friction that it allows us to be honest with ourselves in a way that maybe some other forms of entertainment don't yeah no, but I, what i really appreciated that i mean i've read some <laughs> harder sci-fi we'll say that you know because some of these things are the, they're like kind of like philosophical deep dives into mm-hmm. like what different things like i don't know like a global catastrophe i got that one seven eves uh, is it seven eves by uh 
um jeez oh, what's his name um but it's his name like this happens to me what's, what's it called again seven eves seven eves oh. and, and it was uh like basically a something smashed into the earth or was coming to smash into the earth. They knew it was happening. They had to build like a, a space station. And then was it Larry uh, Niven? No, not Larry no. Niven. It was the guy who was like really big into swords. He's like, um, I remember he had a Kickstarter for like some sort of sword fighting thing, like a little while back. I can't remember. Oh, a contemporary uh, author. Yeah. Contemporary. Um, okay. Anyways, but that was like kind yeah. of like the whole, like the, and the thing was, this, you know, as thick as a you know huge and yeah. uh um, door stoppers yeah exactly right um but it was like you know that the the characters were like it was a multi-generational thing because that's something that happens in a few sci-fi i think i read was it methuselah's children or, or something like that um anyways but like a lot of these stories have like multi it's like you have a generation now and then a generation yeah. later and it's like yeah. the impact of you know whatever whether it's the aliens coming or them going off planet or or whatever um but i found it was um you know what i liked about your story was that it was very much yeah it was very it was it was like a, a story that you know like those kinds of themes could have been um discussed in a story about orcs or you oh, know yeah. god like or goblins or you know yeah. like um no i would i like to think that i tell stories of characters and in all honesty, I used a sci-fi setting, but this story could have been told in a fantasy setting, a Western setting, um, really even a, a woman's fiction setting, uh, something contemporary. Um, mm. My passion lies with sci-fi and fantasy, but by and large, most of my stories are about the characters and the settings and the technology are mentioned, don't get me wrong, but I don't do a deep dive in t into it. So... Um, yeah, I, I I think that that that's really you know I find that interesting. Like that's to me that's the kind of stuff I write. Like generally, like um, or and the kind of stuff that I gravitate gravitate towards is the stuff where the you know the discussion of the characters are is more um, significant. Um, I got a I got a question for you. You're going to Mars. And you yeah. need to take three books with you. Oh yeah. What books would they be? Well, number one would be Earth, the Martian Trans Dictionary. So, because um, it's got to, the planet's got to be populated if if I'm going. So, <laughs> I, I need to be able to talk to the natives. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you didn't say there was any rules. So no, I, there's I, the rules. Okay, so the Martian Dictionary. Yeah, the Martian so Dictionary. Earth, the Martian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, oh. Probably um, some kind of cookbook, and okay. for pleasure reading. Probably Old Man's War by John Scalzi. I've heard a it, lot of it, good things about that. I read it. It's not that old of a book. Um, probably a decade. Maybe even a little less hard to track. But I read it every two to three years. Okay. Um, there, it's, a, it's first in ser a series, but it's just as easy as standalone. Um, he tells characters the way i like to read and and someday hope to be able to write mm -hmm. um the opening lines are embedded in my brain um i think it starts off i did two things on my 70th birthday i visited my wife's grave and i joined the army like it, <laughs> they're bored in there like it 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 um he isn't isn't really... that the premise? Like the whole thing is like instead of sending kids <clears throat> to war they send like if the only way they can draft people is to is like they have to be like you know a, a senior citizen in order to join absolutely the so what yeah. they do is without without any huge spoilers but only uh senior citizens um can join the, the i can't remember what they call it but the colonial force and what they do is mind transfer into young genetically altered bodies to serve out their con military contract and then they are allowed to retire on a colony world so you get people with 50 60 70 years of life experience now in the trenches defending earth on other planets against aliens rather than your 18 19 20 year old kid who does may not have that same life exper experiment uh, experience excuse me yeah. and the difference and the depth of character and is just incredible and it really is something that 
the characters pull me in, the story pulls me in, the humanity of it is just amazing. I love it. It's, okay, awesome. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I, that, that raises a question. Do they have to go back into their older bodies or do they get to keep the new bodies? What they do, uh, uh, spoilers, is yeah, they are spoilers. given a new, younger, unmodified body. So a, a, a normal human body, when they get to retire, they don't have one that is uh, augmented with the strength and the reflexes. And the skin is normal because the military bodies are all green skin. Getting back to your Martian question, which why it popped into my head and yeah. um and that's so it's um kind of similar how they back in world war ii they would uh, dye meat that was only fit for animals green so it was kind of similar that these uh, okay. gen genetically modified bodies of uh, the skin is green to differentiate them from um normal humans okay it wasn't like altered carbon where like their minds would survive death like if they died they were done is that how it went Oh yeah. Sorry, if, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. If, if they die, they're done. Okay. okay. Well, well, kind of. I got to read this book. <laughs> you really do because because the dead wife is a huge factor. So uh, yeah, no, you really should, Andrew. Yeah. Okay, I'll check it out. Man. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned uh, John Scalzi. Is there any other? like big literary sci-fi influences that you, you, you would uh, mention? Um, as a reader, I enjoy uh, Tanya Huff, Canadian sci-fi author, her uh, Confederation series, um, military sci-fi, but it's very character driven, uh, good, enjoyable reads. And another one I, I reread that series every five years, something like that. Um, Elizabeth Moon, um, she's, I can't think of any of her titles off the top of my head or, or the name of her series, but, um, amazing, um, <clears throat> hard question, but I, I read a lot of female authors as well, as well as male authors, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough when I, I came to reading late in life, I had a, a learning disability, so it wasn't until the kind of mid late eighties, did I enjoy reading? And, mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate at that point that there was more women within the sci-fi and fantasy genre publishing. And I have, a I have quite a few, uh, female, uh, well, um, aunts in my family. And so every birthday, um, they would, there would always be uh, a sci-fi or fantasy book there for Peter and women generally like to support women. So, I was quite fortunate that a lot of my early influences were female authors. Okay. So um, not everybody is, has uh, that same experience, even old stuff like Andre Norton. And she's, okay. she's, I can't remember when her first story was, but it would have been in like the forties or fifties. So okay. um, mm. yeah. one of, uh, one of my, I would say one of my formative novels, um, that I like, I, I, that was one I, I haven't read it in years, but when I was growing up, I read it so many times. It was written by one, uh, My Side of the Mountain. Do you ever, do you ever read that one? It was like this kid like goes up to the Catskill Mountains, runs away from home. He's like 12 years old and he like learns to live off the land. There's like little diagrams of the stuff he's doing with. Oh, uh, actually, I think I may have. Yeah. Not in a long, long time though. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it, and like lately, like, you know, I've been trying to mix it up a bit as well. Just, you know, just get different perspective. That's one of the things about fiction. I think like I've, I've read, I've read a few articles over the course of my life about how fiction, um, yeah, it, it emphasizes empathy or brings empathy out of people. And I think a large part of that is because you're getting somebody else's point of view, you know, even though it could be the characters or whatever, like generally people put themselves into the stories and uh yeah i think it's important to kind of read from a diverse selection of you know absolutely people, yeah. yeah no um one thing i love to read but i will never write is historical mysteries mm -hmm. and um i love the um laurie r king um series they're uh, mary oh fudge can't remember the protagonist's last name but anyways the first book is the beekeeper's apprentice and they're sherlock holmes spinoffs 
and I'm a huge Holmes fan. And my mother gave me this book and said, you'll love it. It's about Sherlock Holmes. And I read the back and it's Sherlock Holmes getting married and all this. And like, oh man, that's not my Sherlock Holmes. And mom's, mm-hmm. my mother said, no, read it. You'll enjoy it. And I'm like, crap, mothers are usually right. And uh. as it was, <laughs> and, and, and once again, she was, but uh, yeah, Laurie R. King wrote this series of historical mysteries that deep, uh, like, um, explore a character you thought you knew mm. to find out that maybe you didn't know as much as you did and you're being given an opportunity, a gift in order to know them in a new way from a different perspective. And yeah, no, it's, it's genre fiction can be quite amazing if other than just a, like a, an escapist book or something you read on the beach on your summer break or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's one of the, one of the reasons you know, like that whole, you know, the layers up to people. Cause I think that like generally as humans, what we do is we like to put ourselves, put people in boxes, put ourselves in boxes, put people in boxes and say, this person is this or whatever, you know? And I really enjoy the, um, stuff that kind of subvert, subverts that one of my biggest influences when I was growing up was Irvin Welsh who wrote, like, he was like a working or is a working class Scots author that guy, like he wrote train spotting. It was like, you know, a lot of the stuff is like extreme and graphic and pretty darkly comic, some of it as well. But, you know, it was, you know, the, there's a, you know, I like the st- kind of stories where you kind of think you have an understanding of what a character is and then they kind of throw you a curveball. Very much so. No, I yeah. 100% get what you mean. Yeah. And that's like, not like, personally now with my writing like that whole body bird series that's kind of like a huge element of it because it's like you know i i I, and i find that 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 happens a fair bit with comedy generally like you're kind of like just kind of like subvert expectations and all that kind of stuff but um yeah it's uh and i find that the authors who can do it well like that's one of the most um impressive things to me because like you know like it's so easy to get into like a to make a character one-dimensional let's say oh and like, very much so yeah and if not your character it's very easy or to make your villain yeah. um one-dimensional and your villain in my opinion should or should be just as um layered and depth and deep as your protagonist oh 100 yeah yeah and that's kind of what i'm trying to do uh with my the protagonist with my consensus series um in the first book they're just a general baddie and book two you get maybe some hints that yes they're evil from our perspective but they're they're on a mission of their own they're trying to get home but they've been trying to get home for so long they have forgotten where home is and how to be for lack of a better term, human in their approach. And then mm-hmm. in, th- in our, in our third book, um, you almost empathize with your villain and you don't want to see them defeated. And at mm-hmm. least that's what I'm trying to do with, uh, with this series and, and the readers will have to do, uh, decide one way or the other if I succeed in that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's it, right? Like that's one of the interesting things about writing. You could have like an editor opine on things and, give you their opinion and tell you what works and what doesn't work. Um, but it really comes down to the reader in the end, you know, like what, what the, what the reader gets out of it. and different readers get different things. Like that's one of the things that really boggles my mind about this is reading just like good criticism or reviews or whatever of your work. And some people, <laughs> one person will write something, the next person writes something and it's like, did they read the same book? And it's, yeah. it's very, it's fascinating kind of thing. Well, it's kind of fortuitous that we're talking about that because in today's mail, I got my very first Canada Post delivered fan letter. And you know oh, what? Oh, congratulations. That, yes. That's great. Yeah. And it is four pages of corrections. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my I spoke too soon. <laughs> I spoke too soon. I, I actually have received that kind of thing before. <laughs> and, and it was and it certainly met in a good natured way. 
Yeah. So, but it is not really what I was expecting it yeah. to find in the mailbox today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you have four pages nicely printed um, of suggestions and corrections for molting. So, hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really <laughs> <laughs> totally unprompted, unsolicited. <laughs> That just proves there's somebody watching us because, yeah, yeah, and they have a sense of humor. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, that's really funny, man. Um, so, okay, we, we dealt with a lot of this stuff. I just, so 10 year old dream, 10 year old you dreams about being a writer. Um, and you, you didn't really pick this up seriously until 2015, I think you said, or 2016. Yeah. Um, so, what do you tell your younger self? Well, I guess we have to backtrack a little bit. Like I mentioned before, I have a learning disability. It's a form of dyslexia. I see words out of order and it's, I'm, I'm fairly good with it now. It's only really develops um, when I'm not quite tired. Um, so reading and writing for young Peter was an absolute misery. Mm -hmm. I can't count the number of times I would be bawling my eyes out of the kitchen table with one of my parents trying to help me learn. So I didn't really enjoy reading or let alone writing until I was probably 14. Mm -hmm. And, um, but getting back to your question, I know a lot of people wanted to be a writer at an early age and took courses and such. I've other than Matt's course, I don't, I've never taken a creative writing or, course or anything along those lines. I never submitted something in elementary school, but 10 year old Peter, I would hope to be able to tell him that it's okay to try. Even if you do fail, it may seem like the end of the world at the time, but with a little bit of life experience, you never regret trying something. Mm -hmm. You may at the time and it may end in tears. <laughs> yeah it generally does but <laughs> in the long run you are always glad that you did it yeah so that's what i tell him it doesn't hurt to try that's some good advice that's really yeah. good advice my my own i was kind of i didn't get serious about writing until 2013 and like i kind of wanted to do it when i was younger to some extent but i was so you know, I'm distracted by whatever was on the go, you know, like it was the video games or socializing or whatever, you know. Um, but it was this thing that I kind of wanted to do. And then I, I was, it was right around when I got called to the bar that I was just kind of like, okay, so this thing, I'm, I'm here now, I'm a lawyer and I know there's more to doing it, but it was like, you know, I got this job and now I'm going to work on this job. And it's like, so it's an hour never like you're gonna yeah, you, you know, need an outlet yeah you're gonna, you're gonna do it one way or another well i mean yeah that's that's kind of it too i mean one of the things i love about writing is that it's it's a huge uh has a huge impact on my men mental health in a positive way you know to mm -hmm. kind of and and that brain. was kind of why I, I first picked up the pen is at the time um i had just ended a seven-year toxic relationship looked around and realized I didn't have anybody really to talk to. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the downsides of shift work, you, it's very hard to keep friends, but, um, and to stay out of going too deep into the whiskey bottle, um, feeling sorry for myself, I decided to actually pour some of that angst into a story. And as a means, I had no intention of actually publishing it or submitting it anywhere. It was just my way of kind of purging it from my soul. And um, in the end, it I, it was my very first sale. But I, I didn't go into writing the story as a as to get it published. It was a way just to put words to some of the emotions I was feeling, just because I didn't really have anybody else to talk to about it at the time. And um, that was very powerful for me. A lot of people very much younger than me realized that epiphany, but at the time it seemed like I had vented the wheel when I realized that you could actually express yourself with words. I know I'm, I'm a very late bloomer in many respects. <laughs> like it's funny. Like I got, this, I had a very similar experience. So it was like, um, I, 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 
I, I re- realized it was like, well, it was more so like this, like this burning need to do it, I suppose is one way of describing it. But there's two books that I encountered early, early on. And they were Stephen King's on writing, which is kind of like, I've seen memes where it's like, you're writing starter kit. You want to be a writer starter kit. And that's like one of the things, right? Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And uh, that one, like his advice was extremely helpful like that how the advice portion was so helpful and uh but the other one was the war of art which is a book little book by stephen pressfield it was like my bible for a little while it's like a one pager or so or what page like each each little section was about a page or two and that was one of the things he spoke about and he brought up the whiskey bottle thing is he said that um you know artists can easily fall into um drug habits alcohol habits all these things right and like the antidote is doing the work and like this is kind of like the whole shtick that he's got is like just sitting down in your chair and going to work and put like doing whatever it is whether it's your writing whether it's your painting whether you're doing something and it's uh you know art therapy is a thing like it's definitely a recognized oh it's uh, a beautiful outlet yeah a hundred percent yeah um Do, do, do. Just, just checking. I got, I had a few things written here. Um, you're, you're given a button that makes one piece of your work disappear as if it had never been written. It can be anything you've written. It doesn't have to be published or not, or it could be something that you like. There's a few things in the, on the hard drive somewhere, kicking around somewhere <laughs> that I would <laughs> easily nuke for morbid, but <laughs> yeah. what, what, what uh, would it be? Yeah. Well, it's nothing published, but as an experiment, I tried writing a bit of smut. Oh, right. Just, <laughs> just, yeah, it stuff. was a short what story. Kind of <laughs> just because I'm fairly vanilla in life. Um, and I like, hell, I'm blushing now talking to you about it. <laughs> so, but a lot of people, when I first started writing, there's, there's no lack of people telling you, giving you advice, even if you're not asking for it. But one piece that I did take was try something new and just, even if you fail miserably at it. And so, all right, what's the most non-Peter thing I could think of to write? And it turned out into this little short story i don't know it was six or seven thousand words and i'm pretty sure i've scrubbed it clean from every computer <laughs> <laughs> but it was a piece of alien smut it, yeah no, yeah and um, alien smut it, oh yeah it was because everything was either fantasy or or sci-fi at that stage <laughs> and <laughs> there's a yeah there's a, so, <laughs> sorry go ahead and finish this yeah story. no so um, and fantasy felt like it felt a little restrictive why i don't know but uh, sci-fi felt a little more accepting of that so i can't even really remember the premise and, and i've tried quite hard to forget but that was <laughs> yeah i tried that and realized this is not for me i'm glad i tried yeah. i may have learned one or two things and the the top one uh, thing that i learned the top of the list was don't try this again uh- <laughs> Fair enough. That's, uh, that's really fun. Like I was thinking about, um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously I, I love comedy. That's my like mm. main yeah. shtick now. Right. Yeah. And, um, one of the uh, movies that I, so I, I, I send out like a, like a reader funnel with my newsletter and one of the first, maybe it's the second one. I like, I kind of like briefly touch on like, you know, my influences and, you know, one of the things I used to love doing was hanging out with my siblings and we'd all try to make each other laugh like is and usually or we watch like movies together and you know we had these like cult favorites and one of them was like this universally reviled like so over the top ridiculous um and like off color beyond belief um it was john leguizamo's like big like solo thing from the 90s called the pest um I don't know if you ever seen. It. Anyways, there was no, one. No. There was one line from it where he's just like rolls up on his buddy and his butt. Like they're just hanging out like outside of a club or something, and he says to him, "Would you or would you not 
have sex with a space alien chick with the body of a hot earth woman. <laughs> and it's like, doesn't, doesn't even like, he doesn't even answer the question. Like it just like, it's kind of like a, like an offhand comment, but yeah. it's funny that that was alien smut was the thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> By the time I got to the bit with the tentacles, it was like, oh, my God, are we going to finish this or not? <laughs> You're not and, a uh, late 19th century uh, Japanese painter? <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. So you've, uh, you've written, you've written some fantasy as well. Um, yeah. In terms of your fantasy influences, who, what, who, and what, where, you know, the five Ws? Well, as I mentioned before, I came to reading quite late in life, or later than a lot, and to enjoy it, that is. And the very first series that ever really grabbed me was the Dragonlance books written by uh, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss. And <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm waving my hands. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that was, I have a very distinct memory of that being like one of my first fantasy things. And it was, I had no idea that words could grab me so much. And um, so I was lucky enough to have some uh, friends in junior high that were better off than me so they had all the books so i eventually i'd have to like are you done yet are you done yet so be, before i'd be able to borrow like the the next one in chronicles or the next one in legends from them and uh, i those i reread them every once in a while but i don't want to um overwrite the memory of 14 year old peter of uh, finding them for the first time um other influences from that time, um, David Eddings, um, okay. um, the, was it the Belgarin series? It's a five book series. I'm actually currently rereading it now because I, I needed a little bit of a, a mental break. And just rereading a favorite lets my mind spin mm -hmm. creative as well as enjoy. So, um, but, um, and it's your stereotypical 1982 male protagonist coming of age hero's journey mm. but um there's a which, few written around that time. <laughs> oh lord that was there ever and that's and that's why i i personally shifted from reading more sci-fi from fantasy because it, it felt at a time that there was that's all there was in the fantasy genre yeah, at the time yeah. but um that series I think developed a lot of the tropes we see now and it's very tropey and you expect this come, but at the time he was a forerunner. He may not have invented the wheel, obviously, but he did, he did the whole, um, the, oh, the wise elder character and in a new way and uh, several other things that we can just kind of take for granted now, but it was fresh and new. And it was done purposefully in a way that um, didn't do a disservice to the characters as well. And I, I've, I've, I've always really enjoyed that the secondary characters were given just as much limelight as the, the protagonist of the story, and in some respects, even more. Mm -hmm. And I've always... Um, I've always seen myself as a side character or, or I always, people ask you who you were in high school. And I always respond, I was the asteroid. I was always circling the <laughs> circle in the groups kind of from far. And yeah. so I've always identified with the side characters or the secondary characters in a story. And, um, David Eddings, I always felt did it very well. Nice. Nice. Now I've, I've never read any of his stuff, but right now I'm listening to, um the wheel of time which oh, I, yes. I, I i've been familiar with but it was like so daunting like fucking 14 yeah. books and they're all like they're a thousand stoppers. pages each. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but uh listening to it hasn't been bad because that's pretty much my you, you do crossfit i do walking around a lot yeah. <laughs> so i listen to uh um uh while i'm walking and uh that is one of the greatest parts of that whole because like basically you can look at like randall thor's like the, i don't know if you've seen, read or seen any of the uh, the show or any of that i haven't seen the show but i've read all the books oh you've read all the books okay perfect oh, yeah. yeah yeah so yeah i mean all the different characters are given plenty of time yeah. and uh yeah. massive world building 
Yeah, it's really good. I like I first first book I was kind of like, eh, second book I was like, hmm. and the third book I was like, yeah. <laughs> the first the four book. books were you could have ended it right there to a satisfactory uh, uh, conclusion, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I I agree. It was it's epic. I listen to them myself as audiobooks because my now wife used to live in Fredericton, and when we were seeing each other and even engaged. I'd go up either one or two weekends a month, and that's uh, it's about a five and a half hour drive. Yeah. And instead of like for trying to find a different radio station every twenty minutes as you drove drove through rural uh, New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, I listen to audiobooks. So one whole yeah fall, I think I I did all of the Wheel of Time books, and okay. it was yeah it was quite something. Nice. I used to do that run when I was in law school because my um ex-wife she was my girl my girlfriend at the time i'd have to either pick her up from the airport at in halifax and drive back and it was like kind of like a yeah yeah that was a that gets a little bit long at the end of it yeah yeah um yeah let me just have a quick look there's a couple things that we're getting near the end there so i wanted to cover a couple more things yeah i have Uh, a tendency to black um blabber on so no it's it's great it's great to you know i I love like this this is a lot of fun for me to be honest with you to kind of same yeah chat with people connect um if you had any magic power what would it be and why oh yeah well it wouldn't be flying because i'm scared of heights fair (laughs) just because you have a power doesn't mean you you use it um it sounds kind of creepy, um, but probably invisibility. Okay. I think it would allow me to be, and it. I don't know quite what it says about my personality, but I think being invisible would actually make it so I'm more comfortable around other people. So we're just kind, <laughs> we're just kind of <laughs> fucked up. But, <laughs> oh, um, good. Yeah. Uh, the, the creepy one would be X-ray vision. Let's let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> I could see me falling down the stairs if I had that. I'd turn it on at the wrong time and like, I'm not floating in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. funny. Um, okay, so you you were talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and yes. it's funny that you you mentioned that because me and my buddies, like, we had like my buddy Reed, he had this like box, like it was the A D and D like third edition oh, yeah. box, something like that, and it was yeah. like basically a bunch the of starter like, kit. Yeah, but it was like there was like a, a CD, and it was like done for you missions, and it was like, honest to God, it was like those first three we played those a few times, and it was like me and him played it a few times, but it was like I don't know maybe five times total until he we got into our thirties, I think is when he started, and he like okay because we tried to get, get it going a couple times, and we eventually did, and. Uh, now I play every every other Friday and Reed's like got like all the stuff and it's like done. Like, oh, I'm very so... envious of you. Yeah. <laughs> I, haven't been, I haven't been able to play in, in years just because of my real life job. I never have the same day of the week off. So yeah. um, it is, I, I, I do miss it. Um, yeah. I, I play D&D a lot. It was my first thing that was mine mm-hmm. as, a, as a young teenager that my parents and my siblings didn't understand, but it was, yeah. it was very important to me and mm-hmm. um, it will always hold a, a special place in my heart. Yeah. So who's your character then? Like if you had to well, pick, pick one, just pick, I know there's a bunch, but it was, yeah, pick no, one. Uh, three quarters of the time I always picked a rogue. Um, nice. Probably also speaks to my personality about hiding in shadows and backstabbing people and, and <laughs> And picking up things that may not belong to you. <laughs> but the other third, it was always a paladin. So oh, yeah. it seems to be the holy warrior that's a little bit too self-righteous for his own britches. Yeah. Uh, always has an answer, even if it isn't right, but won't mm. back, won't, uh, back down when wrong. So um, I think those are the two... Um, the two that most uh, reflect my personality 
So uh, you can take out of that whatever you want. It's either a paladin or a backstabbing rogue. So uh, yeah, nice, nice. That's yeah. that's great. A little yeah. bit of uh, the the what's that? The now the, the shadow and the light. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I I go. I'm all mine too. I would say that I plan is so it's either orc barbarian or a bird so those are the ones all the birds well i would be surprised my my buddy he's like uh, like it was when i picked the bird because it was only there's two of us that are pretty much guaranteed and one of my buddies is a he's a cop so he's on a like his schedule is all messed up all over the place yeah so he uh anyway so he'll show up for every once in a while but he was like you know when i picked the bird because like the birds get like pretty good in higher levels but lower levels they're kind of they're kind of shit irritating yeah. annoying yeah <laughs> but it's fun to role play but, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh, i was it's funny i the my that book the body bird was influenced in no small part by my enjoyment of playing a bird in D. yeah well a lot of my first uh fantasy short stories that's they were i i do have an unfinished novel that um is a reflection of a I don't know. I'd say probably a three or four months long campaign that I had planned that never got played. Mm-hmm. And so I've actually, it's floating around here someplace. And I have no idea if it's half as good as my memory says it is, mm-hmm. but um, I may one of these days dig it out. But um, there's nice. no lack of uh, fantasy out there that has been um, inspired by people's playing uh, D&D and other role playing games. And um, I'm glad to see it because our imagination needs to come out in one form or another. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I think that one, that was an apprentice and uh, what was Buddy's name? I read the first three books in that series. Uh, first one was, a, it was like the Magician Trilogy. Um, I think Raymond he wrote, E. Feist? Yeah, 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 Feist. Yeah, he yeah wrote, Pug he, was the main character. Yeah, Pug, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. originally, like that was originally a, um, yeah. uh, a D&D or, yeah. It wasn't they, D&D, it was, yeah. uh, I think it was uh, another uh, brand, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, uh, okay. Magician yeah. Apprentice and Magician Master were the first two of the Rift War series by Raymond yeah. E. Feist, yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so there's a couple other questions I had, but I'm going to skip over them. I just want, this is one for my own personal uh, knowledge that I'm kind of curious of your funniest oh, book, you, funniest book you've ever read. Funniest. Yeah. See, I, I, I'm quite naive. So a lot of humor goes over my head. So I never know if something's funny on purpose or yeah. Funniest book. I suck at this. I'm supposed to, Wait a minute! You sent me that twenty dollars. I'm supposed to say it's your book, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it fifty if you make it extra yeah. sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better make it fifty because my my truck's at a third of a tank. Uh, <laughs> you like what? Another quarter tank? Oh that? lord! Yeah, but funniest book? I don't know. Okay. There's all, every you. book. Yeah, no, yeah, you do. Look, every book's got some humor in it. Yeah. From usually uh, when two characters are um, in some kind of a conflict, but yeah. f- book on its own. Uh, yeah, no, you stumped me. Yeah, okay. no, no, like uh, Hitchhiker's Guide or anything. oh, Douglas Adams. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I guess that was funny. I. It was okay. more, um, I always saw it more as uh, a little more tongue in cheek rather than guffaw funny. Laugh out, laugh out yeah. Laugh, yeah. So I like the sarcastic, kind of understated, dry humor rather than more in your face kind of yeah. stuff. So, yeah. um, fair enough. Don't yeah. read Fool by Christopher Moore or my books <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> I, I, I've tried Fool several times. <laughs> And I can't get into it. Oh uh, yeah, fair I, enough. Yeah, yeah. Humor is a funny, funny thing. Everyone's got a different, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like a different take on it, and a different. Uh, yeah. And I, I really enjoy the different lines people have. That was one of the things. I don't know if you ever. This, there was a movie, um, The Aristocrats, which was about oh, the yes. dirtiest, the dirtiest yeah. joke ever. That that was fascinating to me because it was like you know the 
comedians got into the philosophy of comedy. And I find that for me, anyways, that was like a huge influence on my work, but uh, def definitely a very interesting. Um, and that's a uh, movie I wouldn't have seen if my wife hadn't made me. And <laughs> no, well, and, and I mean that in a good way, because sometimes you need to be pushed out of your own little lane yeah. and you never know where, whether it's a book or a movie or a song or, or anything, um, what might resonate you with you until you, you come across it. So sometimes you do need to be uh, pushed a little bit to explore new things. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. There was something that Jen, um, um, she brought up on, uh, in the John writers of Atlantic Canada, uh, forums the other day. Uh, what was that? Jen Ooh. Shelby. Yeah. Jen Shelby legends and lattes. I think it was, which is like cozy fantasy, which I'd always known about like kind of, a oh, little yes. bit. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to read that now because like, it's definitely something that I wouldn't normally pick up. But And I think that's a genre we're going to see right now. I think it's kind of like where lit RPG is or was a couple, three years ago. I think you're going to see cozy fantasy become in the next three to five, a fairly substantial genre because people want, want that escape, but they also want a little bit of a lighthearted escape just because the world is so heavy right now mm -hmm. and people will still enjoy a heavier book, but you need that palate cleanse every once in a while to not take everything quite so seriously. Yeah. So that's what I'd like my latest ones, especially that's kind of like where I'm leaning. And it was like my last, the ones that the Thoth books that are kind of like finishing up now, they were like, they were lighthearted, like a lot of the humor in it, but there was like some really heavy stuff. I and mean, it was like dealing with the apocalypse and stuff, but really it was like, there was a lot of like stuff about like mental health and like, I put a lot of myself into those books, but it was kind of like after that, I was like, okay, we're going to go for something nice and light and ridiculous and <laughs> <Yeah>. not, <laughs> not too serious. But you needed to get that out of you. Yeah, I did. It was yeah. uh, those, I mean, those two years were crazy, like. It just passed the two year mark there a couple of weeks back, but I, uh, I, I was, I was, cause I dealt with like some mental health stuff in my twenties and this, like, it was like, it was like, I was mostly in remission. Like I'd have my like, you know, bad times all the, you know, here and there, yeah. but I had a few, the pandemic really brought it, brought it out, you know? Yeah, no, I, I get that. Um, my real life day job or whatever, I'm in essential service. So um, I still showed up to work every day. I didn't, I didn't get, and I, I, and I'm not trying to diss on those who had the opportunity, but um, I didn't get to work from home. I didn't get to start my own sourdough um, <laughs> You starter. <laughs> I remember that. that was yeah, the thing I didn't the get to do the sea shanty <laughs> bit, yeah. or like I. That was one of the things that that's what I noticed the most. The pandemic. Um, a lot of people talked about how alone they felt, and all those things were whether people sharing their sourdough recipe on Facebook or whatever allowed them in sm some small respect to feel as a as a part of a, a community. And um, I know those connections are gonna stay with a lot of people for a very long time. And if you can find a little bit of a silver lining around a pandemic, I think that might be it. But um, I miss the fact that I kind of missed out on yeah. some of that connections where I know a lot of people were struggling such as yourself and you were being honest about it, but um, yeah, no, I think we all have struggled in our own little way and we have to be very um, uh, polite in um, being honest with it and allowing people to feel the way they want to feel or need to feel. Yeah, 100%. It's, uh, you know, that was the, the, the one of the things I realized was the most difficult for me was the actual working from home. I know some people like thrived in it, but I like missed being around people you know, all together. Um, but you know, one of yeah, the no. things I found, I, f I found with, uh, the Facebook group is that I kind of leaned in pretty hard on there. And that was, that was a great bit of, uh, connection. This is the genre writers of Atlantic Canada that you're, yeah. you moderate and you're, you're kind of like part of the glue of that community. Well, yeah, no, um, 
Well, thank you. Um, mm. That's what I in, kind of hoped it would be when I created it in 2016 is just because I felt the sense of connection. I went to a couple different cons and sat in at some writing uh, workshops and such from some of the author guests. And I was so energized and it was great. And then I got home and there was nobody around me that felt the same way. And yeah. I didn't have somebody to bounce ideas off of. And so that's why uh, I created the group. And now Thank I, you, by the way, that's yeah, that's well, great. no, and it's just not me. There's, I try quite hard to make sure very early that it's our group. And that's why we have quite a few mod mods and admins. So I have no more say than anybody else in it because other nobody likes a dictatorship. Well, no. unless you, anyways, <laughs> let's not go into real world politics, right? So. Let's stay far away from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. funny. That's funny. Well, um, I think we'll uh, we'll end it there, man. I really appreciate you um, uh, you coming on doing this with me. Like I said, it was great to meet you. Great to chat with you. I'd like to do it again sometime. Um, absolutely, whether with the cameras on or not. Well, um, yeah, we should uh, absolutely connect and raise a glass to each other some night. I'm yes, but for sure, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, I can get. Uh, sometimes work flies us over to Halifax, and if uh, if I'm there for a weekend or something, I'll yeah. I'll see if up. work will do it. Maybe the end of October when Halcon <laughs> should be going on. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah. They one one thing I wanted to do before we signed off here is just um, to, if people want to find you. Um, yeah. What, uh, where's the best place to look for you on the internet? Probably my author page on Facebook. Um, I don't know what the address is right off, but if you type in Peter J. Foot author, um, it should bring you up to my Facebook page. Um, I post once or twice a week, nothing very too heavy or too serious. And that's probably the easiest and best way to find out what the heck's going on with me. Cool. And yeah, the mailing list that you've got, I find mm -hmm. that awesome. And uh, if anyone who's interested in your work, I'd say join yes. Peter's mail mailing list for sure. Yes. And there's a sign up. I think if you click sign up on the author page, that will direct you to a link to my newsletter that comes out monthly. And along those lines, I really need to have a discussion with Grump about this month's newsletter. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> Grump and being the guard, you got he's, he's there kicking around somewhere. Yeah, he's here there. beside me. He's my uh, desk mascot, and he answers the unhelpful life advice column of my uh, newsletter. Yeah, he's pretty. He's pretty good. He's Grump is aptly an apt name for that guy. <laughs> 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 All right, man. Well, thanks again, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll I'll be chatting with you soon. Thanks. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you.